Did you know that hospital patients in darker rooms use more painkillers, report more stress, and have higher mortality rates than patients in brighter rooms? Or that schools with poor space layouts can stunt a child's cognitive development by 25%? Or that sitting in stressful rush hour traffic can increase rates of nighttime domestic violence by up to 9%? Every day, our surroundings affect aspects of our personality and health. In this video, we explore the topic, how architecture shapes our moods and minds, based on the article, how architecture affects our thoughts, mood, and behavior by Danish Karani, a leading expert in architectural psychology. Hello, and welcome to Nalatech Studio, the channel where we apply architectural wisdom to improve our lives and well-being. Architecture is not just the backdrop to our lives, but an active participant shaping who we become. In the pursuit of happiness, health, wealth, identity, spirituality, and creativity, we discover how natural light, colors, sounds, smells, and plants can enhance our mood and well-being. How spaces can motivate us to exercise, eat, or shop. How spaces can shape our habits and routines. How spaces can influence our moral and ethical choices. How spaces can foster divergent and convergent thinking. How spaces can enhance our memory and attention. How spaces can facilitate collaboration and problem solving. How spaces can reflect our history and heritage. How spaces can communicate our personality and style. How spaces can convey our meaning and purpose. How spaces can bring us closer to nature and its benefits. How spaces can inspire awe and wonder. How spaces can support our spiritual and religious practice. But how does architecture actually work on our minds and bodies? What are the psychological mechanisms that explain how our surroundings influence our behavior and mood? Let's explore some of the theories and evidence that Karani uses in his article to answer these questions. The theory of affordances developed by psychologist James Gibson in the 1970s. Affordances are the possibilities for action that an environment offers to an organism. For example, a chair affords sitting, a door affords opening, a staircase affords climbing, and so on. Affordances are not just physical properties of objects, but also perceptual and cognitive ones. They depend on the abilities and goals of the organism, as well as the context and culture. For example, a stair can also afford standing, sitting, or jogging, depending on the situation and the intention of the actor. Affordances are important because they shape our behavior and mood, inviting, suggesting, or discouraging certain actions. For example, a space that affords exercise, such as a gym, a park, or a bike lane, motivates us to be more physically active and healthy. A space that affords social interaction, such as a cafe, a plaza, or a library, encourages us to be more friendly and cooperative. A space that affords learning, such as a classroom, a museum, or a lab, stimulates our curiosity and creativity. However, not all affordances are positive or beneficial. Some affordances can have negative or harmful effects on our behavior and mood. For example, a space that affords violence, such as a dark alley, a prison, or a war zone, can trigger fear, aggression, or trauma. A space that affords isolation, such as a cubicle, a cell, or a bunker, can induce loneliness, depression, or anxiety. A space that affords distraction, such as a mall, a casino, or a highway, reduces our focus, attention, or productivity. Therefore, it is crucial to design spaces that offer the right affordances for the right purposes and people. It makes sense, therefore, to consider the following questions when designing or evaluating a space. What are the goals and needs of the users of the space? What are the affordances that the space offers to the users? Are the affordances aligned with the goals and needs of the users? How can the affordances be enhanced, reduced, or changed to better suit the users? By asking and answering these questions, we can create spaces that influence behavior and mood in positive and meaningful ways. Second is the theory of environmental stress, developed by psychologist Robert Gifford in the 1980s. Environmental stress is the negative psychological and physiological response. That occurs when there is a mismatch between the demands of the environment and the resources or coping abilities of the individual. For example, environmental stress can occur when the environment is too noisy, crowded, polluted, chaotic, or unpredictable. Environmental stress can have various effects on our behavior and mood, such as reducing our performance, efficiency, and quality of work, increasing our errors, accidents, and injuries. 
impairing our memory, attention, and learning, lowering our satisfaction, happiness, and well-being, raising our frustration, anger, and aggression, weakening our immune system, health, and longevity. Therefore, it is important to design spaces that reduce or prevent environmental stress by creating a balance between the demands of the environment and resources or coping abilities of the individual. Consider the following factors when designing or evaluating a space. The physical factors, such as the temperature, lighting, ventilation, noise, and cleanliness of the space. The social factors, such as the density, diversity, and interaction of the people in the space. The personal factors, such as the personality, preferences, and expectations of the individual in the space. The situational factors, such as the duration, frequency, and purpose of the exposure to the space. By considering these factors, we can create spaces that influence our behavior and mood in positive and healthy ways. To illustrate some of the concepts from these theories, let's take a look at a real-life example of how architecture can influence our behavior and mood. This is the approach of the Dibido Francis Keir, the first African to win the prestigious Pritzker Prize. His approach to designing social projects in Burkina Faso, the choice of locally available clay bricks, which have high thermal mass, storing heat during the day and releasing it at night. This regulates the temperature inside the building. The use of natural light ventilation which improve the well-being of the users. The overhanging metal roof that protects the exterior materials from rain and the interior spaces from direct sunlight. A clever design that does not need air conditioning to remain cool. Tall windows that are oriented to maximize natural light and views creating a sense of spaciousness and connection to nature. The interior spaces are designed to foster learning and creativity among students. Bright, airy with large windows that let in natural light and fresh air. The walls are decorated with colorful murals, reflecting the culture and identity of the students. The furniture is simple but functional, which affords flexibility and mobility. Francis Keir clearly seeks to eliminate environmental stress and create the right affordances in his approach, showing that architecture is not just a pretty backdrop to our lives, but an active participant shaping who we become. If you want to learn more about how architecture affects our mood, links to resources in video description below, and for more insights, be sure to subscribe and have a lovely week of mind and mood boost. Cheers.